Good afternoon, advanced algebra students. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Um, we are going to start off doing our notes for chapter four. Um, I am so much enjoying working with you. The first lesson in chapter four is pretty straightforward. It is on inverse variations and the reciprocal function. Um, these, uh, the lesson that we're learning about today is actually pretty cool because there are a lot of applications and real world problems. And so we'll see that in our homework assignment. Um, Chapter three kind of looked at how we can work with polynomial expressions of varying degrees. Chapter four focused specifically on applications related to rational functions. And that sounds really fancy, but when we say rational functions, we mean functions that can be expressed as ratios or just simply as fractions. So a basic, basic inverse variation function is y equals k over x. And we're gonna talk about some simple steps that we can use to evaluate this function. When we have this kind of a situation, we wanna notice that as X goes up, Y is gonna go down. And what we say here is that Y is inversely related to X. And also we might note that K is the constant of variation. You know, I've taught out of several different books and some, some books use different letters. So the letter itself isn't so important, but for purposes of this book, K means the constant of variation. So let's talk about the steps for writing an inverse variation function. Um, and we'll do example one. I will read this problem out loud to you and then we'll talk about how we would actually set it up. So on a guitar, the string length S varies inversely with the frequency f of its vibrations. The frequency of a 26 inch E string is 329.63 cycles per second. What is the frequency when the string length is 13 inches? Now don't worry about writing this all down because we'll kind of do this in pieces. So the, the steps that you want to take here, step one is you want to write the general function. Now, oftentimes, that is just going to be y equals k over x. In this particular case, however, it says the string length s varies inversely with the frequency f. So for our general function, we're going to write s equals k over f. It's a little bit easier to know where to put the data if you use a variable that goes with the data, like s for string and f for frequency. Step two is to plug in the X and Y and solve for K. Plug in X and Y and solve for K. In this particular example, we're gonna plug in the S and the F. So we're, we are told in this problem that there is a 26 inch string. So we're gonna put 26 in for string length. And we'll, t we'll toad told that the frequency is 329.63. To solve for K, all we have to do is cross multiply. So we're going to get K is 26 times 329.63. When I multiply that on my calculator, I'm going to get 8,570.38. So we've now done step two. Step three is to rewrite the general equation with K. So instead of writing um, S equals K over F, I'm gonna write S equals 8570.38 over F. And then, um, so now we have our general equation. Sometimes that's all that you're asked to do, but oftentimes in this problem, they'll ask you to solve this for another value. So the last sentence says, what is the frequency when the string length is 13 inches? So for step four, we're gonna find a new value for y by plugging in X. 
So oftentimes, when you're done setting up your general equation, you'll be asked to follow up and solve for a new variable. In this particular case, they're actually asking us what is the frequency when the string length is 13. So they're actually um, giving us the equivalent of y. But if we put in here 13 for s, we're going to have 13 equals 8570.38 over f. Again, we can cross multiply. So we have 13F, and I apologize that all these things are running together. Um, I'm trying to leave room on the other side of the board for another example in a minute, but it's not really working. Um, 13F equals 8570.38. Divide both sides by 13. And we're going to get that the new frequency is 659.26. Now, oftentimes the examples will be easier than that because on our videos, we have kind of limited time for examples. I've just used, you know, one that shows you a little bit more of the complex nature of some of the problems. Okay, so that's how we're gonna use inverse variation. I also wanna talk about how to graph something that is in this format. And I had hoped to put that over here, but I think we're running out of space. I'm gonna. I'm going to erase this so that we just have more of a clean start for our second board here for example number two. So for example number two, we want to graph y is equal to 4 over x. And again, we've got some steps for this. So let's write the steps over here. Step one is to graph and label the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Now, the vertical asymptote you can get by setting the denominator equal to zero and the horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals zero. So let's do this particular example here. Um, we want our vertical asymptote to be the denominator equal to zero. Our horizontal asymptote is going to just be y equals zero. So let's go ahead and graph those on a chart. Now, the line x equals zero is the line when x is always zero. That is another name for the y-axis. I'll graph this in purple. Maybe that will help it stick out a little bit. And then the line y equals zero is when y is always zero, and that would be the equivalent of the x-axis. After we have graphed the vertical and horizontal asymptotes, step two is to create a t-chart using two x values to the left and right of the vertical asymptote. So if our vertical asymptote here is where x is equal to zero, I can use a t-chart in this case where x is negative two and negative one and positive one and positive two. And I would just plug in values for x. So for example, if x is negative two, y is going to be 4 divided by negative 2, which is negative 2. So let's plot these points. Uh, negative 2, negative 2 would be right here. Negative 1, negative 4 would be here. 1, 4 is this spot here, and 2, 2 is here. Um, and then step 3 is to graph the two branches using those points. Now, it is considered acceptable in this scenario to graph your asymptotes and then to just show a curve, curved branch, where the branch never crosses over that asymptote. Notice that they are symmetrical. Step four is to state the domain and range. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. 
the domain is all the possible x values. We know that we can't divide by zero, so we can say all real numbers x not equal to zero. With the range, we would also say all real numbers y not equal to zero. Notice that both branches get closer and closer to y equals zero, but they never actually touch it. Now, like any function, a graph like this can be translated. So we're gonna keep the same steps here but graph something that's a little bit different. So for example, it could look like this, y equals one over x minus h plus k. So to graph a transformed function like this, we would use the same steps as above. To get the vertical asymptote, we would still set the denominator equal to zero and solve. However, to get the horizontal asymptote, the equation is now y equals k. So make a note that in this case, the horizontal asymptote is the line y equals k. All right, let's do an example. Let's say that f of x is equal to one over x minus one plus two. Again, we're going through the same steps that we did before with this one little change here. So to get the vertical asymptote, we're gonna set the denominator equal to zero and get that x equals one is our vertical asymptote. So we're gonna show a line where x is always one. That is our vertical asymptote, x equals one. The horizontal asymptote is gonna be the line y equals k, or in this case, y equals two. So we're gonna go up two and put a horizontal asymptote there. All right, now we're gonna do our t-chart like we did before. Again, because our, horiz our vertical asymptote is at one, I wanna go two spots to the left of that. So negative one and zero, as well as two spots to the right, two and three. And plug all of those into this function. So for example, if I plug negative one in here, I'm gonna have one divided by negative two, which is negative one half plus two, which is one and a half and these would be the rest of the values that I would get. So let's plot those points. At negative one, I'm at one and a half up. At zero, I'm at one. At two, I'm at one, two, three. And at three, I'm at two and a half. Again, we're forming the branches using those points like that, making sure that they never touch. Our domain now is going to be all x, x not equal to one. And obviously our range is gonna be all y, y not equal to two. All right, I hope that that has been helpful to you and I can't wait to see you in class. Thanks guys.